Welcome to How to Revise Your Work, part of the Biodefense Capstone course. Our agenda with this lecture, threefold. First, a little discussion of what the actual goals of revising are, and then a little word about the reviewing, I'm sorry, the revising mindset, and then finally, a in-depth look at the revising process to make sure that when you revise, you get the most out of the process because uh, there's revising and then there's revising. Okay, let's jump into it. You know, fairly obviously, the main goal of revising is to make your work better and hopefully way better. And if you're like many students, you've gone through school being pretty good at writing and, you know, very good at thinking. And especially as an undergrad, you may not have been stretched to revise your work very often. And I certainly know as a grad student, I did not, was not given any time to revise because one schedule is extremely demanding and there might be three 20 page papers all due within a week. And you've got barely any time to finish them, much less revise any of them. And so it's very common that the master's project paper or thesis is the first time that someone's had a chance and been pushed to think about how to revise their work in a serious way. And so as a result of that, one of the things that certainly came as a surprise to me when I started um, revising finally is just how much better things are that I write after I've revised them a few times compared to what I used to be able to do on a one-shot deal. And so you know, obviously then the, the goal we've talked about in the very beginning is to write the very best paper that you can because it's your calling card. It's going to be your signature product to the world. Your writing is going to be the way you reach fame and glory and make the big bucks. And so anything you can do that will make your work as much better as revising will is a strategy that you need to perfect. So that's the goal of this lecture is to talk about how to do that in a serious way. So clearly, you know, the two sort of big chunks of what you're trying to make better is first and most obviously any major errors in your data, your methods, or your argument. And you know, frankly, this is relatively uncommon because you know, as an analyst, you're pretty good at this sort of stuff. But it does happen though that you may have not thought of a particular analytical strategy that you then realize, oh, I need to add that. Uh, maybe you were hoping to get done, you know, sooner rather than later, so you didn't do you know, maybe the fairly obvious, but really, you know, time consuming thing. And then when someone reads it, they go, mm, nope, you need to do that or else I'm not buying it. So, you know, you might need to fix some, you know, major chunk of analysis data type of thing. But th that's not as common as the need for all of us to improve our writing. Um, well, let me step back a minute. Uh, errors in data methods or argument. Um, the, the most common of those that we're revising is the argument part. Um, because typically the data and methods are fixed, they're done, there's not much in many cases you're going to do about that. You know, if you did a survey, if you did a, you know, a model, if you did interviews, if you have three case studies, you know, it, the data are what they are, to use an overly hackneyed phrase. But what you can change is how you talk about that data and the analysis that you have derived from it. Um, and so, you know, what is the argument, what is the narrative that you're, or the frame that you're roping around these things. So the, the argument is the, is the one major thing that you can do. In fact, I've seen people take the same data and write essentially two different papers with it. So that is one thing. Um, but the thing that we're always doing, no matter whether we're happy with the data methods and argument or not, is we're working to radically improve our writing. And here, you know, if you've just listened to the previous lecture, you know, we're talking about professional grade writing. So we're talking about clarity, concision, professionalism, and of course the beauty. Uh, we're trying to make sure that this is far above the standard material that someone is reading. So people read a lot of crap. There's mostly junk out there. Uh, we want our words to sing. We want people to really understand. We want them to be fully persuaded. We want them to be able to do this efficiently without a waste of time. We want them to think we are a smart, capable person when they're finished. Um, and we want them to show it to other people. So you know, we're looking at revising as a way of making sure that we're putting our best foot forward um, and frankly getting the most out of all the hard work we did to produce the data, to produce the analysis, and to come up with a creative and insightful argument. So um, the first step to doing carrying out a great revision is to adopt the revising mindset. And I've, I've invoked the mindset concept previously. And at this point in your project, you need to now adopt the revising mindset. And this 
is hard to do because it's not the one that we are naturally accustomed to. Uh, because we are author-centric when we're writing, because that's who we are, we're the author. And so we think about what's good for us, what's interesting to us, what do I care about, what's the next thing I think is important, uh, what persuades me. And then once you are going to that final step of trying to figure out how to make this document work in the real world, all of a sudden you're confronted with the fact that the most important person or persons in the equation, not you, is the, is the readers. It's the people who are trying to get something from your document. And as it turns out, they're the ones who matter the most. And so the most important thing for you to do when you're revising is to be reader-centric. Um, so, you know, the goal of your paper is to inform and persuade an audience. So the things that that implies are that you first have to be open to reviewer feedback. Um, we'll talk more about this, but, you know, uh, if you are author-centric, you tell reviewers to go punt when they say something nasty about your work. Um, and, you know, hey, if you're a poet or maybe a novelist, then, you know, feel free to, to be an auteur and to be a creative and to, you know, yell when people don't understand your vision. Um, but when you're a social scientist or an analyst and your goal is to inform and persuade people, if they finish and they're not persuaded, that's your fault, um, not their fault. So you need to be open to the, what the reader thinks. And the first and most important reader of this semester are going to be your reviewers. And, you know, in life, it's your boss or, you know, your peers, your peer managers, analysts, whoever is consuming and using your work. If you're a scholar, it's journal ed uh, editors and anonymous reviewers. Um, and they, they are the uh, gatekeepers for you and the judges and the juries. So you have to be open to their feedback first. Uh, to understand and incorporate that feedback into your work the next round, you have to be honest with yourself. So part of the revising mindset is honesty. Um, you know, we're not perfect people. We don't write perfect things. We don't analyze perfectly. Uh, sometimes our data and methods are sketchy. Um, you know, as hard as we try to do these things right, there's always flaws. Everything can be made better. And so, you know, when you say, as inevitably will happen, you'll read a comment that a reviewer makes and you'll go, I disagree, that's horrible, they don't get it, yada yada. Um, you know, force yourself to take a step back and say, all right, look, I know I'm not perfect. Nothing I will ever write is going to be perfect. So when this comes back to me, I'm going to, I'm going to be open and I'm going to be honest, you know, that my stuff isn't perfect so that I can accept that there might be things that need to change. And this is really hard. So this is why there's a lecture on it. <laughs> um, and then the final thing kind of sort of the pro level version of, of revising is to be able to put yourself in the mindset of the audience and to try to figure out if you're reading this for uh, information about a topic or to be persuaded about something, um, you know, think about how the audience is seeing this. And frankly, this is really hard. And that's why we have outside reviewers and we ask other people to read our work because that's really one of the hardest things to do. And, and even when you have practice at this, it's sometimes very hard to do because you've just spent too long with the project. So, you know, you want to try to do that as much as you can, but understanding that there are going to be limits to that. All right, so you're, you're now adopting a reader-centric mindset. What then is the process? And I'm going to lay out here sort of an eight-step process to reviewing. And again, this may seem a little Germanic. Uh, I like to label and number everything. But again, just in, you know, on the notion that probably most of you haven't done this in a super serious way before, let me just lay out all the steps so that you can kind of borrow from that. And you may come up with your own better reviewing process that works for you. But you know, this is how I do it. So I'm sharing what I know. Okay, so the reviewing process starts when you finished your draft. So the first step once you finish the draft, is then to send your paper out for review. And in your case, pretty specifically, you're going to send it to your writing partner. You're going to send it to me. Um, you might want to give it to your spouse, to a friend, parents. Um, it's really a great idea, if you can, um, to send it to a civilian, um, somebody who's not an expert, someone who loves you and cares about you, but not so much that they won't criticize you, of course, um, but someone who doesn't know the jargon. So and for those people, the clarity is key. So you know they really will hold you to a, a different standard, whereas someone who's an expert in the same thing you are, they'll understand things. So they'll let stuff slide because they know what you're talking about. Um, so it can be really good. But uh, it's key while you send your paper out for review to take a little bit of a break and to refresh yourself because, um, you know, you don't, fresh eyes are going to do better uh, than um, tired eyes on these sorts of things. So you're going to send your paper out for review 
And that will come back in a week or so uh, in your case. Sometimes it's much, much longer, in which case you may, in fact, um, you know, not take, like in the case of a journal, it can take two, three months to get a review back. And you may or may not wait that whole time to go back and, and start trying to revise. Um, but, you know, typically I actually do. I, I actually just wait and I work on other things. Um, so then when you get the review back, don't read it right away. All right? Hold on to it for a second. Before you read that, I want you to reread the introduction to your paper, your summary introduction, which, as we all know, answers all the important questions that a summary introduction needs to answer and is thus very good. And um, you're going to reread that in order to refresh in your own mind what your main point was. What were the main arguments you were making? What was the purpose of your paper? And you want to have that as the anchor so that you can judge and understand the review. Uh, and then also, so that when you read the paper over again at some point, you know, you've really refreshed in your mind what you were trying to do. Okay? After you've done that, then you're going to crack the seal on that email and you're going to print out the review. I suggest you print it out um, and, and put it next to you and, you know, so you can have a nice, uh, you know, clean workspace. And I, I just find that easier myself. Read the reviews and, again, adopt the openness and the flexibility of a reader-centric mind. And, you know, don't try to take things too personally. Don't get overly emotional. This is not an attack on you. This is not something saying you're a dumb person because somebody didn't like what you wrote. Um, one way I find it um, sometimes useful is to think, because uh, whenever we write something, we take ownership of it. And um, so then we're very hurt sometimes when we've poured our blood uh, and sweat and tears into a project. Um, we're, we're upset when somebody says something bad about it. It's like somebody insulting your baby. Um, I think ownership of a project um, is the wrong metaphor for us to adopt. Um, we're not really creating ideas here. We're, you know, we're repackaging. We are, yeah, we're doing something new, but um, I think ownership is maybe too strong a word. I, I like to think of myself as a shepherd of ideas. I'm shepherding ideas. I'm shepherding information. I'm shepherding data. I'm shepherding analysis. And, you know, I'm responsible for that process. And so I, I want to do it well. Um, but when someone says that, the data aren't perfect, or the writing isn't perfect, or the ideas aren't perfect. I, if I feel like I'm the shepherd of those things, I don't feel like it's so personal. And so I'm like, fine, I want to shepherd the best set I can. If you can tell me some better things to go shepherd, I'll go shepherd those. Um, if there's something I should let go from the flock and shepherd something else in instead, fine. Um, if, you know, other people can have ideas that can feed into your project. And I, because I can guarantee you, no one ever wrote a paper where they didn't need other people's ideas. And so, you know, um, think of yourself as a shepherd rather than an owner. Maybe that will help. Um, probably won't help perfectly. Everyone gets mad um, and, and upset, as I've said, about the review process. So prepare yourself. Have a cup of tea, whatever it takes. Read the review, okay? Now, then, um, read your paper again in light of the review. You've just read the review. You're a little bit verklempt. Um, you, you're feeling maybe not as good about your paper as you did when you wrote it. Um, you have maybe a sinking feeling. I'm like, Lord, there's a lot to fix. Crap. Um, and you might get depressed. Um, fine. That's normal. <laughs> that is totally normal. Then what you need to do is read your paper again. And that's going to be um, interesting because I think you'll, 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 two things will happen. One is you're going to feel better than you did right after you read the review. Because when you read the review, you know, typically you're reading criticisms. Um, and so no wonder you're focused on the stuff that's lacking or the stuff that's not as good. But as you reread your paper, you're going to be reminded of all the stuff that is good in it. There's lots of good stuff in it. They didn't criticize the whole thing. They criticize bits and pieces constructively, hopefully, to make it better. But that doesn't mean it doesn't start off good. It has lots of good stuff in there. And you're going to feel, you're going to be reminded of that when you read your paper again. But the second thing that's going to happen, and this is the critical thing for the reviewing process and the revising process is that you need to, and I've just realized I typed reviewing process at the beginning, you should say revising process. Arg. Anyway, it's the review and revise. You get what I mean. Okay. So the second thing that's going to happen, first is you're going to realize your paper is better than you thought. But the second thing is that you're going to reread it with the reviewer's comments fresh in your mind, and you're going to realize that they're right about a lot of things, right? Our knee-jerk reaction, again, to sometimes we read the reviews, no, I didn't, uh-uh, no, it's, I didn't do that at all. Then you read through it again, you go, okay, you know what? 
I, okay, I see it now. I, I didn't see it the first time I wrote it, but now that you've pointed out, yeah, that sentence could be cleaner. That paragraph is a little misleading. That chart, not clear. I didn't label that very well. Okay, fine, right? Again, the reader's always right here. Um, and the thing is, is you'll feel both better about the paper, but also understand, you know, that things need to be fixed when you read it. And that, that's as it should be, okay? So then once you've read the reviews and then you've read your paper, what you're gonna wanna do is make a list of all the revisions. And even though you've got this nice reviewer um, uh, page or you know whatever, a couple pages even, of the review with, with a list from your writing partner, I want you to take out a piece of paper and make your own list. And your list will contain both the revisions that they have suggested and then also the revisions that you think of as you're reading the paper. And in fact, I, I probably should mention, as, as you're reading your paper, you're gonna to wanna to make marginalia, you know, comments, comments in the margin to yourself, circle things that, you know, because you're reading it with fresh eyes, pop off to you as, oh, that's not what I meant, or that's not as clear as it could be. And you'll make your own comments, and then you'll combine that into a list. And, you know, because sometimes reviewers write things like, um, that, that, you know, they might combine several revisions in one sentence. And so you want to just be real specific and make a list of every discrete um, revision that you're going to make, even small. Like I, you know, I, um, uh, uh, anything that's not just a typo or something you can circle, right? Um, you know, page two, paragraph two, uh, make more clear. Right, do, do that from, and then you want to prioritize that. So you might actually write it down twice, just once to get everything down on the piece of paper, and a second to prioritize them so you have a plan of attack. And I think your goal should be to start um, with the big stuff because, and the reason there's a reason for this, because you might be saying, no, you know, the way I like to work is I like to start with little stuff, get confident, get my mojo working, and then I'll tackle the big stuff because frankly, I'm too scared of that right now. And that's an excellent strategy for many things, but. There's one big reason why it doesn't work for revising, and that is many times the one or two biggest things that you're going to tackle will potentially obliterate um, content and or structures in your paper, thus actually getting rid of certain small tasks that you might have had. Like, for instance, let's say I was reading page 13 of my paper and I noticed a couple of typos um, or small thing like, you know, there's a couple sentences that weren't clear in the third paragraph on page 13. And so I write that down on my list of revisions to make. But when I do my revised, my, you know, my prioritized list, um, it turns out I'm going to cut that section anyway. <laughs> so guess what? I'm never going to get to that. So if I did the little one and then I cut the section, I'm, I'm sort of annoyed that I wasted my time. So, um, you know, I'm promising that's always going to happen, but I, that's almost always what happens to me is that some of my little stuff I never have to get to because it's been overtaken by events. Um, so I suggest that you start from the big and work down to the small. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, it turns out, of course, there's yin-yang to all this stuff because there's certainly benefits to starting with the little stuff and working up steam and then you can tackle the big. But on the other hand, there's actually a real benefit too from starting the other way around if you can manage it, which is once you've done the biggest things, the little stuff's just details. You, you just whiz through that happy because you've already done the hard part. So there's that. Okay, then once you have your revisions, then you're gonna start, you know, making them. And um, in so doing, you are basically going to be writing your second draft. And, you know, exactly how you go about doing that um, might, might differ depending on, um, you know, everybody's own inclinations and your, uh, like how much time you have to sit down at any one time. You might choose, um, you know, Monday I'm gonna do that one big thing that's looming, like that's really gonna reorganize my thing because I kind of have to rethink something. And you might carve out one whole day and just work on that. Um, another day you might um, work on, you know, two or three medium chunks that, after that. And, um, and then you might save all the little creepy crap for uh, when you go back and do it all at once or something like that. A lot of different ways to, to do that. But basically you're just going to now go through it and create another draft. And um, there's no, uh, there, there is a sort of a decreasing returns that you run into eventually. The first review you get is the best one that does the most for you. Obviously, you, you see all the big rocks that need you know moving. Um, but uh, I will admit that probably most of the stuff that I've published uh, has undergone multiple revisions uh, in order to be crystal clear. Um, because, the, you know, and I'm sure you've all suffered this problem before, but, you know, digital computing makes cutting and pasting so easy. 
um, and moving things around so easy that a lot of times we lose clarity because we are too quick to cut and paste and you wind up, um, I wind up a lot of times moving things and then redeciding about where I should go and oh no, no, that paragraph should go after this one and oh, you know, reorganize, reorganize and then I can end up with a Frankenstein draft and so my second draft sometimes is like not really very much better than the first one. It may be better content but it's like not in the right order. So my third draft, if you will, right? And then um, you might even say I have a fourth, fifth, and sixth draft in a sense because I'll go back through it and you know maybe 90% of percent of it will be fine, but the discussion section is not very good. So I might actually start a fresh document and, and just rewrite a discussion document, like outline it from scratch, redo it without looking at the old one because sometimes looking at that old one is um, you know a, a ball and chain, it drags me down. So I want to retype and see if I can come up with something better, sort of fresh. Uh, and so, you know, like for my dissertation, for example, I calculated that I probably wrote um, various sections over about nine times, you know, and that's not, you know, there's no requirement to do that crazy stuff, but, um, you know, two, two or three times over something is not unusual to get it right. And, you know, again, every kind of paper is a little different. Some things are pretty straightforward. You don't need to do any such thing, uh, you know, three or four times. Some things are tricky, especially if you have a tricky argument with a lot of nuance. You might write that section several times over to get it just where you want it. Okay, once you've got that next draft, right, um, and again, that's, that's an emotional process because you are grappling with your, you know, emotions around being reviewed. You are, you know, pushing yourself to do more work on a project that you might be tired of at this point. That's a very big deal here. Um, and it gets hard because you're in the middle of this big project with all these details roaming around your mind. It's, it's hard to stay fresh. So you can, you'll burn out quicker from writing the second draft than you did from the first one probably. So you want to let it breathe a day. Put it in the drawer. You know, you hear this a lot, but it's really true. So put it away. Let it breathe for a day or two, depending on how much time you have. You know, give it, give it time. Then get it back out and, um, and you'll be fresh again, which is critical. Fresh as possible is the best thing. And now I'm going to give you the piece de resistance tip that you've heard nowhere else before. And this may even sound strange to you um, to do with an analytical or an academic paper um, because I, you know, I just never heard anyone say this except me. So this is all special secret sauce right here. Then I want you to read your paper out loud to yourself because there is simply nothing better at detecting baloney, confusion, and baffling terminology than reading it out loud to yourself. And so, again, two things happen when you read it out loud to yourself. One is you catch stuff that your eye has been blurring over because you never said it out loud to hear how dumb it is. And especially I catch overly long sentences, sentences where I repeat words like two sentences in a row, but I just stop seeing it. Um, you know, awkward phrasing it becomes very obvious when you read it out loud. The second thing, however, that I think you'll find when you read it out loud to yourself is that you'll be proud of what you just wrote because you'll read a few of those sentences. You go, dang, that's a smart thing I just said right there. And it feels even better when you say it out loud somehow. So you sort of imagine yourself presenting this to an audience and you're feeling pretty good about it. Um, and, you know, that's a flag. If you don't feel kind of good about it, you, you might need to revise again. Um, so the read out loud yourself trick is, I think, the cherry on top of this process. And once you've walked through this uh, eight-step, roughly, uh, process, I think I can promise you, I will in fact guarantee you, that the final draft you turn in will bear no resemblance to the quality of your first draft. It will be infinitely better, and you will be the happier for it. Okay, good luck with that, and I look forward to seeing you guys online.